Good morning, everybody. Welcome to uh, From the Deep End. It is Thursday, August the 4th. It is so very good to be with you today. Of course, uh, my name is uh, Jonathan Jenkins. Um, we are here every Monday through Thursday uh, for two hours of good Bible study. Thank you all for tuning in and choosing to be a part of the, uh, the program with us today. Uh, being Thursday, uh, of course, I have with us, or we have with us, um, my dad, uh, Dan Jenkins, is going to be a part of the program this morning. Uh, our run of um, connection issues and sound issues is co continuing. We we've had a problem with my dad this morning. Uh, it's not coming across the stream as far as I can tell, but he apparently is hearing his voice twice, and I'm not sure what is the, the cause of that. We seem to have had a a string of them lately it's starting to make me wonder if uh, something else is going on there but uh, uh, hopefully we'll be able to uh, uh, soldier along this morning in a good way uh, we'll get him here in just a second uh, on from the deep end for those who are who are our regular viewers and he just disappeared so that's not really good either uh, there he is but those who are our regular viewers know that in the uh, first hour of this program we um, sit around and we answer your Bible questions so uh, uh, every question, every kind of question is on the table, so go ahead and, and put those in if you uh, have anything on your mind this morning, which you'd like to hear us um, uh, talk about today. We'd love to, 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 to discuss it with you. Um, always keeping in mind that sometimes our favorite answer is simply, I don't know, which is a perfectly good answer uh, that we give, hopefully not too often, but every time it's applicable, we try to make sure that we give it properly. So, uh, well, that, I guess, well, I guess all the from us. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yep, I can hear you. I can hear me I twice. Can hear me twice. <laughs> I'm, I'm not sure what's going on. Uh, we have had a string of um, of um, those kind of issues lately, and I don't know where that is coming from. It shouldn't be. If you're hearing yourself twice, twice, it shouldn't be me. I mean, I'm wearing a wearing an earbud so there, it's not like, well, it's, I, it's well, not like I, my, my speakers are peering, putting it back into my microphone or anything so I, I don't know what uh, what's going on there so but anyway uh, and second hour of the program by the way uh, just to finish that up we will uh, turn our attention to our study of the book of uh, first Peter again uh, we'll be in chapter 3 as we were uh, yesterday morning as well Dan is echoing where is that coming from not echoing to me. I don't know. I don't know. See if it's, See if six, it's now. six now. No, no. Wonder if um, they can hear him twice too. I'm not hearing you twice. I'm only hearing you once. Testing, Testing one, two, three. What in the world is going on there? How well, are they doing? Let me shut all the way down. I'll be back. I'll be back. I'll be back. I'll be back. I think it's on my end. I think it's on my end. Okay. How are they hearing you twice, but I'm not? That one makes okay, no okay. sense to me. I, I'm going to shut down. Let me let me shut this thing down. Down, 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 down. Come back. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Start dealing with the first question. First question. I'll correct all the mistakes you make when I get back. <laughs> all right. We'll do that. Um, no, Teresa, he's not on a uh, on a second device. Something has changed because this is this is a string of issues. How on earth would they be hearing you twice and I'm not? Feed is coming to me. I have no idea how that's working. I have no idea how that is working. That is peculiar. Trying to see if there's anything I'm running here that's got um, 
<laughs> Brother Dan, uh, Thursday already. Brother Dan is echoing twi twice the wisdom. There, there you go, Mercy. <laughs> that's, that's that's just about right. Um, well, I hate that we're having these issues. Um, that one's a weird one. That is a weird one. I have no idea. How you all would be hearing an echo where I am not. Because the speeds comes to that, that that one I can't even yeah, okay Teresa, that that's what's not I don't think it's on my end. Shouldn't be on my end. Uh the, the, these uh, the, this the system has a, a an echo cancellation feature on it. Which is supposed to allow you to uh, uh, not to have that issue, um, and yeah. So I don't I don't know what the uh, what the deal is with him. Uh, but anyway, let's go ahead and see if there's anything in, in there while he's coming back. Uh, um, Ronald's got a question there about Revelation one. Uh, boy, really need to let. Get my dad back in here before we start talking about the Book of Revelation. That that that, that he, he he's the he's the guru on the Book of Revelation. Hate to answer Revelation. Oh, there we go. Told you, Alabama football is always on the table. What do you think about Bama's chances of getting past uh get get of getting beat by us dogs again? Are y'all gonna make it to the title game? Are, are you sure, Jonathan? You're actually gonna win the SEC East? Because I mean that's not a given. Um. Um, well, there you go. It's not a given. So you probably should, uh, you probably should be careful. Probably should be careful. A healthy Alabama. No, nobody's beating a healthy Alabama this year. Not unless they just lay an egg somewhere. Um, no, not this year. That That's going to be, uh, that's going to be a solid team this year. Going to be solid. Going to be solid. Um, and y'all lost a lot. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I like our chances. I like our chances. Offensively, defensively, both are looking really good. Really good. I hope your little, um, little, little cute little quarterback you've got knows how to run a lot. Because the Alabama pass rush is coming, it's 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 it's, it's coming this year. Uh, so anyway, uh, let's see what we got here. My dad's taking a while to get back here. Um, let's go ahead and talk talk about Ronald's question here for just a minute. Uh, can you speak on Revelation one fourteen through sixteen? What does this? What is this symbol? Or what what is this symbol? Or what is it uh, symbolic of? Um, um, fourteen through sixteen says the um, hairs of his head were white, uh, like white wool, like snow. Uh, his eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze, refined in a furnace. And his voice was like the roar of many waters. In his right hand, he held the seven stars, and from his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun, shining in full strength. That's what those particular verses say. Um, and Ronald, I don't know particularly what your uh, your particular question there is. Um, you know how, how we say sometimes, like I say pretty much every morning, that sometimes a uh, I don't know is a perfectly good answer? Uh, that, that's where I'm going to start with this one, is, is I don't know. Uh, does that help you any? <laughs> um, you know, there, there, there's obviously an image being painted here about this one who's like the son of man, which we understand, we believe to be the Christ here and all that. Um, you know, the um, right hand, he holds the seven stars from his mouth comes a sharp two edged sword. Uh, the, um, you know, the two edged sword, obviously you go back to the book of Hebrews, sounds a whole lot like the, 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 the the word of God being sharper than any two-edged sword, um, and, and so on. Um, but like the, the specific images here 
uh, like why are his eyes a flaming fire? Okay, uh, is that could be different, say, than perhaps? Let's see, he's back. Let's let's go with bringing him in. Hey, Dad, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Still hearing Can the echo? Hear yep, I hear you fine. All right, everything's fixed. I'm not sure why. And, uh, uh, I saw the question about Revelation 1, I, uh, and you're doing a good job. Just keep right on rolling and everything, okay? <laughs> okay, uh, we got the echo fixed. Things in Revelation that are symbolic only have meanings in one of two ways that we're able to understand. One is, does the Bible explain the meaning? Sometimes there are things that are so plainly stated that uh, that in every culture, we understand them. Uh, John sees a vision and uh, it may not symbolize anything. He may be just describing what he saw. Now, if it has meaning, it would not be meaning that necessarily comes from the from the rest of the Bible. His hair being white as snow and like the like the uh, uh, you know like, like the wool that's on a lamb and everything. When I read about his eyes being like fire, I can understand that somewhat. Uh, it's either anger or it is a piercing look. Which one of those I don't know, and I'm content to just back away and stand there and say. John, tell me what you saw. He said, this is what I saw. His feet were like polished brass. What's that? It may have symbolism there in a Greek culture. It's a symbolism I just do not understand. If his feet were standing on the rock of Gibraltar, I would understand that. You see, because that's the culture in which I live. And so uh, it may not symbolize anything, but... Uh, it is remarkable that when he writes to the letters, writes each of the, to each of the seven churches in Asia, the description of Jesus in the beginning verse to each of those seven churches takes on some of the symbolism that saw that that he saw, and uh, uh, I'm content when I come to the Book of Revelation just to say I'm content not to know that. Maybe if I, I study more, I'll have a greater understanding of it. Uh, it uh, may symbolize, but it may not. It is just, uh, uh, you know, when he's standing, when the dragon comes out and he's standing by the sea, is that the Mediterranean Sea or is that the Sea of Galilee or, or whatever? And so uh, it's just what he saw. John saw a vision. And uh, the, uh, a vision, whenever, whenever Peter saw the vision let down from heaven, what does the pig in that... Uh, sheet that was let down from heaven, what does it symbolize? What does the sheet symbolize? It may not symbolize anything unless the text says it has symbolic meaning. So when I'm, I'm content when I get to that era to think, does the Bible itself explain this? If it does, then I've got some real basis to start looking at it and trying to come to an understanding of it. But to my knowledge, not every description that is used of Jesus in Revelation chapter 1, 14 to 16, is explained elsewhere in the Bible. Then if it has symbolic meaning, it would have symbolic meaning only to those individuals in those seven churches. They would readily get it. Uh, I think the classic illustration of that is the symbolism that we use in English and that, that you cannot translate, I think, into any other language. And the symbolism is, I told him this, and he swallowed it hook, line, and sinker. We immediately get it. But you go to Africa and talk hook, line, and sinker. What meaning? It has no meaning at all. It's a local cultural thing. And so there may be symbolism that's involved there. I just don't know what it is. Why? Because I didn't live at that time. Yeah. Um, and, you know, in, in terms of, well, the, the thought I was talking about right as you came in is it says his eyes were like flame of fire. And then it says his face shone like the sun in full strength. What if you flipped those? What if, what if his eyes were like the sun at full strength and his, uh, his face was like a flame of fire? Would that, would that substantially change your interpretation of the passage? You know, I, I don't think it would. I mean, in, in terms of the the, the, the symbolism, um, 
and 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 that's the problem when you try to make too much of these uh, of the of these images and and and, and the description uh, when you because it's it's it. it there's no way of, of having any certainty with it. Um, if, if it were different, we wouldn't know it, obviously, if, we're, if it were just different. And that's because there's nothing inherent about the meaning that, at least to us, as you say, at least to us, has, has any particular meaning. Now, did that did the, do those images have a particular meaning to the seven churches of Asia? Like you said, we, we don't know that yet. We don't, we're, not, we're not there, and we don't, we don't have their, their background, their culture, and all that. So... Um, perhaps there's meaning, but if there is, I'm going to go back to the, to the answer that we pull out sometimes, which is, I don't know. I don't know. Um, I, I, I can get a sense of the picture. It's like Ezekiel chapter one. Uh, the, uh, the, the complexity of the image that's there in Ezekiel chapter one. And sometimes people will try and sit around and figure out what on earth is going on there in Ezekiel's vision. And, um, I, again, I have no idea no idea what it means. I do know that by the time you get to the end of Ezekiel chapter one, you have a, a, a you should have a mental picture at least of something that is just completely fascinating. That is completely, that you would be awestruck if you could see it. And that is exactly the image that Ezekiel paints for you with those words. And that's the point that he's trying to get you to, trying to get you to understand uh, the glory of God. And, and there it is. It, it's in an incredible image. And I think you actually, by trying to take it and pick each 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 thing apart, uh, first of all, you don't know if you're doing it right. And secondly, I think you're under you're 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 missing the point of the entire package. And, uh, you know, it's, it's be, be like looking at the Mona Lisa and all you want to talk about are the brush strokes that created the created the image. OK, that's not the point. The, the, the sometimes Bible students get caught up in the, the technicality of things and sometimes miss the actual um, the actual point, which is not the specific images, but rather the the totality and the picture that it's painting. So anyway, um, that's I don't have anything else on that unless you do that. Well, uh, when I teach the book of Revelation, I, I talk about the fact that we read these and we get some sort of a picture. But whenever you try to put it down on paper, you cannot do it. One of the assignments I give when I teach the book of Revelation is I'm going to read these verses. You take a piece of paper and you draw what John saw. And I read chapter four about the throne that he saw in heaven and, and part of chapter five and ask them to put that down on paper. You cannot draw on a piece of paper what John saw. Where are the 24 elders and where is that sea? And, and, uh, and where is that rainbow? And, And every time I've asked individuals to do this, unless they've heard me talk about this, when they draw the rainbow, guess what it is? It's the pot of gold rainbow. You know what the text says? The rainbow was all around the throne. You've never seen a rainbow like that at all. And so John said, let me tell you what I saw. And that's what heaven looks like. And that is John's description of what heaven looks like in relationship to that. And when you try to draw the... uh, the uh, angels that are, are part of the, the heavenly messengers that are flying around the throne, you cannot physically draw it. You just absolutely cannot put wings on it and put eyes all over those wings. It just, you, it, you, you, when you try to put eyes on those wings, there's no room for feathers. Unless you're a peacock, I guess I just had that thought, but you understand what I'm saying. Uh, right, you cannot right. physically do it. It is imagery. It is a vision. And uh, the illustration sometimes I use is to um, you go to uh, watch an action on the stage of a play, high school play. And when the screen opens, there's a couch that's sitting on the right side of that uh, of that stage. And on the right end of that stage is a three legged table that has a red lamp on it that is burning. And if you try to figure out what that red lamp lamp symbolizes, and what it means when it the light was turned on. What does that mean? You will miss everything that happens on the play, on the stage. And that's exactly what we do in the book of Revelation. We get over there and we get look at the minutiae so much, we lose sight of the big pictures. The reason uh, they had a three-legged uh, table at the right end of that is 
because when they went back to the prop section at the school, the only table they had there was a three-legged table and not a four-legged table. So it doesn't represent the Trinity, you understand? And that's the kind of thing that individual, and the ramlet, red lamp does not recognize or uh, symbolize communism. They had a red lamp because the teacher said, anybody got a lamp at home you could bring? And one of the students said, I've got one. And he brought a red one as opposed to the blue one. It has nothing at all to do with what's happening on the stage. It is a picture. So when I read Revelation 1, I just stand there with John and I stand in absolute amazement. Now, if the author of that play has used symbolic symbolism like red lamps in other times and other places, it may have symbolism, but it's not up to me to arbitrarily give symbolic meaning to what state, what is sitting on the stage, the three-legged table, the fact it's on the, uh, the, uh, uh, the right end of the couch instead of the left end of the couch, uh, unless the author has used that in previous time. And the same thing about the book of revelation. If God has not used this symbolism elsewhere, then, uh, well, brother camp used to say, if God didn't see fit to explain that to you, don't worry about it. And, and you get to the end of chapter one of the revelation and it says, Oh, and by the way, as for the mystery of the seven stars, and, and, it, and it tells you, this is the point you need to know about everything you, you just saw. It, it's not like there are things. It's not like nothing is ever explained in the book of revelation. There are several things that are just flat out explained. Um, and, when you hold on to those things and kind of build your framework for understanding the book around the things that are explained, it, it, it really helps you just, you know, those are, those are guideposts. Th those are the, the markers that you need to, to begin to understand the book. Um, and it, it is amazing when you, you're reading the commentaries on revelation or whatever, how much time people spend on the things that are not explained and how much weight sometimes is put on the things that are not explained versus the things that are explained. Uh, um, and I think if, you, if you'd spend your time looking at the things that are explained, you'd probably end up um, being a whole lot better off. Um, but I think the point you're just making there, Dad, is is also that um, the book of Revelation is, you talk about things being explained elsewhere in Scripture. Uh, I think I may have been you who gave me the number, but there aren't there some, there's something like 250, 270 quotations or allusions to uh the Old Testament passages in the Old or in the Book of Revelation, which is you know, twenty-two chapters. It's it's more than 10, 10 allusions to the Old Testament per chapter of the Book of Revelation. Um, and you know, even when things aren't explained in the Book of Revelation, sometimes the Old Testament is the best commentary you'll ever find uh, on on the Book of Revelation. Let me, get, let me give you the shallow view of Revelation, and it is worth as much as the overall view. There is warfare that is going on between righteousness and unrighteousness. In this book are four enemies. There is a dragon, there's the beast of the sea, there's the beast of the land, and there is the woman. You read that book and you step back and say, what's happening on the stage? There are four villains that walk on that stage. You know what happens on that stage? Every single one of the enemies is defeated and God reigns. And that's what the book of Revelation is all about. And if I'm not able to go in and figure out every aspect of it, I must never ever lose sight of the fact that it was written to Christians who were just about to lose their faith because it looked like they were losing the battle. It looked like that the beast and the woman and the beast of the, the, of the land and the dragon, it looks like they were winning. And it is a book written to suffering saints that says, let me tell you this, we're going to win. Now, if it, symbolic language had not been used, that very message could have been used by the woman, by the beast, by the dragon, and by the beast of the, of the land to bring harm and greater persecutions on the Christians. And so there is a code to the book of Revelation, but don't lose sight of the fact that even without the biblical code, you can understand that book. 
that's the simple view of the book and and let a babe in christ read that and not get worried about every bit of it and everything what's happening on the stage there are four villains that walk on the stage and every one of them is defeated, bound for a thousand years, cast into the lake of fire and brimstone. And he may not have a, any idea what that lake of fire and brimstone is. He really may not, but we win. That's what's happened on the stage. And to get to this book and to worry, uh, spend all of the time trying to figure out that third hump on the back of that, of that dragon, though the Bible doesn't mention the humps, but you understand, but you know, every dragon's got humps on the back. Every dragon you've ever seen looks that way. <laughs> and what's that third hump? Is it is it on the left side or the right side of the big hump? And and that's the way people come to the book of Revelation. And that's one reason they think it's so difficult to understand. If you'll just sit back and see the, see the heavenly screen open. And John says, let me tell you what I saw in heaven. I saw symbolically things that were going to happen. And the symbolism are two beasts, a dragon, and a woman. Those are the villains, and they all lose. That's the simple story of the book of Revelation. Since we're on that topic, uh, I had another question about Revelation come in. Um, and I don't know if your answer will be any different to it. Uh, but Jonathan asked, um, what is the mark of the beast? Um Today, people have a very modern idea about it. Uh, Jonathan lists some options there, some barcodes, some computer chips, that kind of thing. Um, um, I've even heard some things. I think Jonathan mentions that earlier or later in, in the thread here about, uh, um, you know, some of the injections that people are receiving, that kind of stuff. Um, seems like to me it's a first century book dealing with first century issues. So I'm going to guess not bar barcodes or computer chips. But uh, you got any thoughts on the mark of the beast, Dad? Well, obviously, it's your social security number. Absolutely. <laughs> okay. okay. Now, anybody could not figure that out. I mean, doesn't everybody have their social security number tattooed on their hand? Isn't that remarkable? Whenever you came out of the Second World War and we found out what Hitler was doing to those POWs over there and tattooing numbers on their, on their physical body to follow them. The, the, the televangelists, and we didn't have television at the end of the Second World War, but radio evangelists went crazy saying the government's going to come in and tattoo your social security number. You know what the mark of the beast is? It was a symbolic thing that if you did not have a proof, a symbolic proof that you had worshipped the beast, you could not buy or sell or get gain. Was that literally a thing that was tattooed? No, it's a book of symbolism. But they readily understood when they read that, that who that enemy was, they knew who was enforcing the rules that say, if you do not worship the beast, they would know exactly who that beast was because it was a book written to them of things which must shortly happen. And they understood it immediately. They had no trouble at all figuring out who the beast was. All they had to do was look up and see who's persecuting us. Who is saying, if you don't worship the beast, whatever that beast is, you cannot even provide for your family. They got it just like that. And if we're content to stop right there, instead of trying to sensationalize it, and I think it, I think it is amazing when that barcode first came out on products and was that in the, in the sixties, uh, I guess when you first saw, the barcode on the on the products that you buy, and it's on everything that you buy now. Obviously, mm -hmm. uh, you know there's a barcode if you if you order something from Amazon. There's a barcode on that. You, you you understand? Well, then Amazon must be the beast, and that's what people do. They just look around, wonder what could it be, and they see a barcode, you know, and they've got the you know. What would an alcoholic think when he reads about a barcode? Do you understand what I'm saying? It, it, <laughs> it, 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 that, but that's how excited people get. I've discovered something nobody else is doing, and it all fades away. It's been ages since I've heard any televangelist talk about Gog and Magog or Russia. It's been ages. Now, Second World War, it was Hitler. You know, it was, it, it, it was, it was not the allies. It was the axis. 
And then that commentator that I'm still looking to buy, and I'll give you $300 if you can find that commentary written during the American Civil War that found every battle of the American Civil War. I would give anything to have that book because I, you know, I'm fascinated by Civil War history because my great grandfathers were you know, involved in it uh, in, in, in some amazing ways. My, my grandfather told some stories about my great grandfathers that are, they've never been able to be confirmed or everything, but, uh, uh, but I, and so I'm fascinated by that. But I just think it would be interesting to find out who was the rider on the white horse. Now, my guess is that if the rider on the white horse is Robert E. Lee and Robert E. Lee wins the battle, that it was obviously written by a Southerner, you know, <laughs> but, uh, you know but whoever had the red saddle on the back of his horse, because remember that dragon was red. He's a bad guy, and that'd have to be the northern states, depending whether you're a southerner or a, uh, or a northerner writing that Ooh. book. I just think it'd be a fascinating book to read to see what individuals have done. But all we got to do is pick up older commentaries. I'm go you you go down to the uh, uh, to Goodwill and you see one of these old books written by somebody like Ironside or some individual that wrote books way back yonder, nearly 70, 80 years ago. Pick it up, buy it, look at it. You'll be astounded how how popular that writings could have been and how out of date every bit of its symbols. And that's exactly what's happening. This thing about a computer chip, we've gotten to the point of putting putting computer chips under dogs in, in the under the skin of dogs. So watch out, the beast is coming, is going to put a computer chip in you. How on earth would that have been a message to seven churches in Asia? It's not even happened in America yet. It's happened in the imagination of somebody who says, you better watch out. They're, they're going to put a chip in you and that they're going to put it in your food and it's going to implant itself in your body. I mean, people just go absolutely insane when it comes to this book. They do. Um, one of my favorite tidbits along those lines is that song. Sometimes we sing Jesus is coming soon which I think the second verse references, not Revelation as much, really kind of references Matthew chapter 24. Have you ever looked at the date that it was written? No, I not. The publishing date, if I'm not mistaken, it's been a while since I've done it, but I think I remember this right. The publishing date of that song is 1946, <laughs> which means it was probably sung, probably written, 44, 45, something along those lines, which... I mean, you can understand it, right? Right, right at the peak of World War II, you've got to be thinking if you're the, if you're if you're of that of that mindset about Revelation and all, all you know all the all these type passages. Oh man, all the signs are here. Everything's going on. There's wars and kingdom, nation rising against nation, and, and so on. All the signs are here. Jesus has to be coming back soon, and it's just it, it's it, that song is a product of its age, um, and you know. Wow. And you're right. We, from different years and, and you get it. So anyway. What um, a great illustration, Jonathan. If that date of that book is uh, of that song and it's got the, the, the beat and the rhythm, those old Stamps Baxter's kind of songs, you know, that they used to sing many years ago with a lot of alto leads and everything has that very ring to it. It may even be earlier than, than the date you gave it. Well, what a powerful yeah, I, I, illustration. That, if that song was written in the 40s and they sang it in the 40s, when they got to the 50s, they had, you know, Russia with intercontinental missiles. Well, that's that's exactly what it's talking about. Now, we're not worried about ICBMs. We're worried about we're worried about those things that are up in the sky. And that is satellites sending down fire and brimstone on us. And I'm telling you, these UFOs, they've got to be in the Bible somewhere. And so let's just make them a part of the trouble sometimes. But, you know. But uh, UFOs are, you know, every generation is going to look out there. And so every COVID is a part of it. Somebody put a comment over there that the COVID was the, was the beast. I saw that comment. Where'd that come from? It comes from some sensational individual who, instead of studying the Bible, has read something in the Bible and then turns his attention to what's happening in our society. And that's why you get all these crazy ideas as to what it is. Those symbols in the book of Revelation, 
meant what it meant to first century Christians. Now, if they could find that symbolism in the Bible, and you're so right about how many references there are in the, in the book of Revelation to the Old Testament, and you find, you, I've, I've seen the number go as high as 400, Jonathan, but uh, take the smaller <laughs> number, 10 times in every chapter. If it's 400, then, then, uh, then, then that's 20 times in every chapter. And you've only got 20 verses in every chapter. I mean, I mean, you, you understand what I'm saying. It's got to be in every verse that's right. there. Uh, but if it's found in the Old Testament, get over there and diligently study. What, how was this word used? How were locusts used in the book of Joel? Chapter two, it's called a northern army. Is there a lo locust that comes out of the bottomless pit? Yeah. Uh, I, know where the, I know what the bottomless pit is. The Bible says it's the place where the demons were going to be cast. That's, that is uh, when, whenever uh, Jesus came to the Gadarenes and the, the, uh, man's, uh, the, the demons in them and the man says, cast us into the swine. Don't cast us into the abyss. Same word. It's the place where demonic spirits were going to be cast. I know that. Why? God told me that. Something out of the bottomless pit, devilish, hellish, is, a, is an arm, is, is locust, literal locust? No. Figurative, symbolically used in the Old Testament to an army, to an army that came. And so I, I learned it in the Old Testament. I see that symbolism in the New Testament. The curtain opens, I see locusts come out of the bottomless pit. Well, how many legs does a locust have? Oh, is it eight or six? I guess it's eight. I have no idea how many legs the <laughs> locust has. The spider has eight. But if it has six, then I've got to find the number six somewhere in our. Oh, I know three locusts, six, six, six. I got it. Let me write my book right now. But that's why people come to this book. They, it's exactly they, how people they, they, they see something in the Bible. And instead of trying to discover what God says about it, they just then look out in their society where there is the number six. And I'm telling you, don't ever drive down highway six because it may lead you to route 66. And there you got it. <laughs> six, six, six. There you it was go. fun. <laughs> Yes, sir. Uh, different topic. Uh, hey, ask a question. Uh, it was actually two questions, kind of a two-parter there. Um, number one, what's your take on I, I, I can forgive, but not I cannot forget? And secondly, does the uh, gr gr uh, not cr making any graven images, would that include uh, include photographs? So um, first question there, uh, wh what is your thought on um, I, can, I can forgive, but I cannot forget? Um. You can't erase things from your memory. You know, every, everything that has been traumatic in our life is a part of who we are. The, the way that I've heard it best expressed is I remember so vividly the day he did me wrong. Let me tell you what I remember even more vividly. And that is the day you asked me to forgive him. I believe that's where you deal with it. And somebody's done you wrong and, and you have not, uh, they've not asked for forgiveness and everything. Has God forgiven them? No, God hasn't forgiven them. And, and so I need to understand, I need to want them to repent. But the Bible says, if a brother sins against you seven times in one day, and in one day, seven times he asks forgiveness, you forgive him. I remember that I kept count of the seven times he did me wrong. And I have another memory of the seven times he asked me forgive him, and I'm going to treat him as though it never happened. That's, that's the way I deal with it. Well, what about the hurt that I feel? Well, read the book of Psalms, see what David did with, and how God, David over and over prayed to God that he would say, Lord, take up your sword and your shield and your and your buckler, whatever a buckler is, and you bring it against my enemies. He dug a pit for me to fall in. God, let him fall into the, into the pit. And that's a man after God's own heart. And that is to cry. Book of Revelation, get back to it. Souls under the altar are crying out, Lord, how long is it going to be before you bring judgment against those who have slain our brethren? 
They were crying out to God. How do you deal with hurt? You, 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 uh, you don't give place to wrath. You cast all of your concern, trusting God, he's going to settle the score. I, I, I believe that's the, that's the best advice. But when I heard that expression, it made such a profound impression on me. I remember the day he hurt me and I remember the pain, but I even remember in a greater way the day he asked me to forgive him. And that's how you deal with it. And how can you treat him? Because it would never happen. That's what agape love says. You know, if somebody walks up to you and uh, yells pumpernickel and then slaps you across the face and then asks you to forgive them when they repent, you forgive them. If they walk up to you again and yell pumpernickel and slap you across the face and ask you to forgive them afterwards, you forgive them. But I'm, I'm somewhere about that third time, if you walk up to me and yell pumpernickel, I'm going to put my hand up. <laughs> That's right. That doesn't mean I didn't forgive you. It just means, hey, hey, I'm learning something here. Uh, uh, I'm going to try not to let you slap me the third time. Uh, you know, so I, I, I forgave you. I, I, we didn't injure the relationship. We didn't end the relationship. Yeah. But I'm not forgetting the fact that I got slapped across the face twice. Right. And uh, it, it's in my brain that it's at least a possibility. You might do that the third time. That's right. <laughs> it's, it's 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 in my brain. I've got I've got it. It's in there. Uh, so uh, I, I I appreciate the sentiment. You know, forgive and forget sentiment. I get that. But you know, uh, there there's there's there there are consequences to actions as well that don't have to do with uh, that don't have to do with it. Yes, Jonathan. <laughs> yes, Jonathan. That's one. <laughs> <laughs> well, <it's one. laughs> you got two more and that's it after that. That's I like it. what Brother Keeble uh, said. Brother Keeble said it didn't make me a judge, it just made me a fruit inspector. How genuine is his repentance? Know. And at some point, though he may verbalize the word that says I repent, he hadn't repented at all. He's not changed any action at all. But if he hollers pumper pumper nickel seven times in a day and seven times genuinely repents. I'm as obligated the seventh time as I was the first time, but by their fruits, you shall know them. And uh, there, there's that aspect of it. Well, just yeah, a I'm, parallel I'm thought. And that is uh, the Bible. So inspired as you were talking about this, I think about that verse that says, give to him that asketh of thee and from him that would borrow thee, turn thou not away. If you read that, then a person could come and borrow $10 from you you know, in the next five minutes and come back five minutes later, give me another 10, give me another 10, give me another 10, give me another 10. Before long, your bank account is empty. One of the marks of the inspiration is when you look at the original Greek, it's the aorist participle that is there. Aorist, talk about a one-time occasion. It's not that imperfect tense that says over and over and over and over and over again. Otherwise, you would be penniless by the end of the day. The Lord did not say, keep on giving it to him that is asking and keep on giving, keep on giving. Why? Because if you do, you've not been good stewards of that which God has given to you. I just love that. When I discovered that about the air is tense, I, it, it changed my attitude toward helping people that refuse to work. See, it's another Bible principle and refuse to work. Neither should he eat. Well, I'm not obligated to give food to everybody that asks me. Why? If he's lazy, I'm not obligated to, to, to give him food. Now, then, if he's genuinely in need, the story of the Good Samaritan comes in. And so I can't just hide behind. Well, I'm a priest and I'm a Levite. I don't help, have to help this, this individual. That violates the whole tenor of the scriptures. But it's by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Exactly. Absolutely. All right. Um, second part of that question. About graven uh, images and photos, uh, yeah. Jonathan, you want to talk yeah. about that? And the second part of that, the graven images and the photos. Um, um, well, obviously the photos weren't included in the Ten Commandments because the technology did, did not yet exist. Uh, I, 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 just, I would just say, given the particular the sequencing of the, uh, of the Ten Commandments, uh, you know, those, those graven images are obviously intended to be things that are worshipped, things that are things that are being turned into idols. Um, I don't know that even back then 
if somebody is just doing a, a you know, a, a piece of artwork, you know, a, a family portrait of their of their people and their and their great, you know, carving something to to make a piece of art. Uh, that that's not an idol. That's a decoration. I don't even know that I would extend it to those that, to, to that extent. Um, you know, obviously the, the the this is the making of gods. Don't have any other gods before me. Don't take my name in vain. Don't make any graven images. We're talking here about the sanctity and the holiness of God. Um, and that seems to be seems to me to be the scope of it there. Uh, and so you know, obviously the day you're taking a, a family photo or. I guess if you like taking selfies, whatever, I guess. But maybe those selfies are a little bit idolatrous from time to time. <laughs> but, um, but you know, I, I, I would limit it to uh, to that context would be would be my thought of the matter. You, you have any thoughts on that? Well, just to put it in the context of images. Anything that I make a graven image is forbidden. It's a substitute for God. But a photograph is so far removed from that. And did not God use images throughout the Bible? When we're talking about the visions of Ezekiel and the visions that are found, the, the bed sheet that Peter showed, those are just images. And we're not making graven images. And in the context, that expression, graven image. Now, I believe it's the Amish people in America that will not have photographs made. Or at least some of them are hesitant about it. Would it be all right for me as a scruple to decide, I don't want to make any photographs. Sure, you have that right. You have liberty in Christ. And if your conscience would not allow you to, to have a, on, on, a, for spiritual reasons, will not allow you to have a photograph. That doesn't mean you're evil. It doesn't mean you're vile. It just means you're respecting God. You may misunderstand the application of what God has said, but the application of graven image, the very image itself is talking about idolatry. And you can take anything and make an image out of that you worship. You take an automobile, you know, a man wastes all of his money on his automobiles, doesn't feed his family and neglects his family because every afternoon he comes home from work, has got to wash the car and neglects his wife and everything. What's he got? He's got a graven image out there. It's not one he's made, but it is one he has adopted. And by the way, Christine, I think in reference to those individuals that will not work, we ought to give them pumpernickel. I just think that's a, I see that <laughs> comment that's there. I, I absolutely love it. Let's use pumpernickel for a godly reason, okay? There you go. Uh, there's a kind of a follow-up question to that one. Um, that um, Let's see if I added on there. Yeah, Mercy added, added on uh, about the graven image. Um, there are, there are people who have the idea, um, rightly or wrongly that, uh, we should not wear like a cross around a, on a necklace or something of that, that nature. Um, I've even seen, uh, people have the idea that, you know, some of the old communion, the covers to the communion trays, the handle on, on top of those would be a cross symbol. Um, or, uh, sometimes you'll see on the Lord's the table that holds the, the elements for the Lord's supper, do this in remembrance of me. Uh, I think that one of the churches we were in when I was a kid somewhere had a, at the end of either that's uh, that, that sentence, that, that saying was, you know, uh, uh, carved into the table. And I think it had a cross. On, it had uh, a cross behind the baptistry. It was uh, the congregation you grew up in, in Birmingham had a cross behind the baptistry. Yeah. I don't know if you ever saw it or not. Oh, no. well, we were righteous. We did not have a, we did not have a corpus on the cross corpus, meaning a body. <laughs> And you think Corpus Christus, you know, the name of that city. I cannot even live in that city. Why? Corpus Christus, <laughs> the body of Jesus. And, but, uh, you know, well, we, we did not, we did not have, uh, uh, but if I'm not mistaken, that congregation had a cross behind the baptistry. I could be wrong about it, but I'm, it could have been there. It could have been a, the, the congregation, the other, that you grew up in when you were four, five, six years of age. It may have been that one on the other side of Birmingham and everything. But uh, there was a, there was a church I preached in that I preached below a cross every day. And, uh, and uh, the, uh, I, I just think it's amazing that, that, that we, we, we take the whole attitude of the Pharisees and we make laws about how far is a Sabbath day's journey. I cannot violate the Sabbath. And the Bible doesn't even forbid a Sabbath day's journey. That's one of the tradition of the Jewish fathers, but they would fuss over uh, 
over 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 that. Now then, if I worship the cross and the cross becomes more meaningful to me than Jesus, I've made an idol out of it. But because somebody has a cross, you know, you know, uh, you you can find a cross anywhere you want to, even in the ruins of the towers that fell down in New York. Remember the cross, the symbolic cross that was there. You can see a cross in every time woods cross, two pieces of wood cross another. And so it's the, they're all around us. Uh, it depends on why I wear a cross and everything. Uh, do I have a, a, chain, a gold chain with a cross? No. Why? Nobody's ever given me one, and I don't even know if I'd wear it if, I'd, if, if somebody gave it to me, just because it might send a wrong message to those whose attitude is the Corpus Christus is all that matters. And I'm wearing a gold cross. I probably would not wear one in Italy if, if to use an illustration of a heavily Catholic country. Why send the wrong message, send the wrong message. But as you know, decoration, and, and uh, there's, one of the there's, things there's, that, uh, one of the things that sometimes we particularly people affiliated with churches of Christ don't appreciate is the different styles of crosses have for particularly Roman Catholics, uh, Eastern Orthodox or Reformed churches, you know, the, the, those that are more historically connected to, to, to church traditions, each one of the crosses that you'll see has a different meaning. Uh, it comes out of a different uh, a religious background. It, 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 it symbolizes a particular church symbolizes particular activities of different churches. Uh, it, the, the, the iconography of, of, of crosses is much more complex than sometimes we, because we don't typically have those things and we don't understand them. So if, if you do have some piece of jewelry or something like that, that is a cross, I would, I would suggest you make sure you, you check that out because you may be unintentionally sending a message out that well unintentionally you, you don't mean to you don't mean to be sending that message out making that statement because you you were shopping in the store and you saw uh, a cross that you thought was attractive and, and 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 you bought it so sometimes there's more significance not not because of the the thing that it is you know it's just a piece of it's a piece of metal but because of the meaning that other people have assigned to the particular shape of that piece of metal uh, just, just make sure about that before you, you put something on that you think is just a, a reminder of, uh, of of your faith. Um, it may have a meaning deeper than you think it does. That's, so, that, that's um, so true. All right, let's let's move on to the next one here. We got about we got about two or three minutes here. Um, uh, let's see if we can squeeze one more in. I don't think. Hey, I don't think we're getting to that second question of yours. There, we'll talk about demon possession. If you remind me, we, we can do that. Uh, on Monday, on Monday, uh, but Christine asks, "Where there is no law, there is no transgression." Could you please explain Romans four fifteen and uh, five thirteen uh, in that in that regard? Um, Romans four fifteen is uh, just that that statement: that "There is where there is no law, there is no transgression." Uh, you got a, a quick quick take on that, Dad? Well, you're the you're the you've just been teaching the the book of Romans. I'd say put it in context. I mean, I mean, in chapter four, how chapter four began. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not Im, does does not impute uh, his sin. That, that is that is the whole context of 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 this, and uh, and to and to to come to a conclusion. Uh, that some come to in relationship to this is is really really far from it. But John, why don't you go first on this? I'll I'll come in after you. I've been talking the whole day today. <laughs> well, that's why we have you on. Um, by the way, we've had the largest audience today than that we've ever had on from the deep end. This is the largest audience we have ever had on the show this morning. Um, but anyway. Um, uh, you know, in, in, that, in that context, obviously, you are talking about you know, salvation apart from, from the works of the law. Uh, and um, I, I, I'm not particularly, I'm not exactly sure what, what, your, what your question there is about that, Christine. But obviously, if there is no law and sin is a transgression of the law, 1 John 3, 4, where there is no law, you can't break the law, right? I mean, if, there, if you're driving down the road and there's no speed limit on the road, 
You can drive as fast as you want to. There's no speed limit on the road. Um, and, um, and, and so that, that's going to be the case with God where there is no law. There, there, there can be no sin. Um, and I mean, that would be the, I, I'm not sure what else to say on that other than that, that that's the thought is that, that there is no, um, that well, there can by, be no transgression. By definition, no sin is the transgression of the law. That's the Bible description right. of what sin is. But some have come to this and said, where there is no specific statement from God, thou shall not, then oh, there's okay. no so law no against limit. doing this okay. sort of thing. And so some individuals say, well, uh, you know, where does, where does the, the Bible forbid? And they, they pick some, some, some sin that they want to yeah. commit. And they say, well, the Bible doesn't specifically mention this word. And therefore, there is no law and there is no transgression. And so right. it, uh, right. it depends on the, the background of that question and how individuals are using it in relationship to this. I mean, the book of Romans yeah. talks about they were, they, the, the sin of Adam was unique from Adam until Moses. Uh, but because once the law was written down, it becomes more obvious. It doesn't mean there was no law, no commandments from God, no rule from God before we get to the time of Moses. And so you've got to, uh, I need to know a little bit more about what what individuals are asking when there's where there is no law, there's no transgression. But I think the very common yeah. usage of it is, well, here's my pet sin, and the Bible does not say thou shall not have, shall shall not do, thou shall not be, and because it does say does not specifically say, then there is no law. There are things the Bible condemns by principle. And what the Bible forbids by principle is the law of God. Right, right. And if that's where you're going with the question, that that that's exactly that's exactly the answer. Is the Bible does the Bible does not authorize by what it does not say. It authorizes by what it says. Uh, and 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 if if that's the case, you know, sometimes uh, just by God specifying action A to be done, it excludes every other possible action. Um, and and so, you know, the, the Bible doesn't have to say thou shalt not when it has already said thou shalt. Um, and, and so that would be um, that that would be, yeah, that would be the take. And then Christine comes back and says, that's exactly what I asked. Just repeated the, that question. Uh, and so, yeah, uh, Christine, uh, with the time that we've got, that that's that's going to be going to be the answer is, is that uh, you're going to be looking for the things that um, that God has said and the principles that then can apply, obviously, in other areas as well. Um all right. Well, um, let, let me make a comment. I mean, I saw this about unleavened bread. I forgot who made that comment. And there, there is that aspect of, of that very unleavened bread. Is the unleavened bread holy at other times? Could you just eat unleavened bread because you like unleavened ble bread? I remember at West Huntsville when I was a kid, and I was the I was the smallest kid in the church. I mean, had old brothers and cousins at, the, and so the. Uh, when Sunday night services were over, we're oftentimes not allowed to do it on Sunday morning, but we had the Lord's Supper reserved for those on Sunday night. Sunday night after services, all of those big kids would beat me to the table to eat the unleavened bread. And there were some people really horrified by it. So elders made a decision, well, let's just not do that anymore. That, that bread is, 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 uh, is good bread. It, it takes on a spiritual nature Whenever in the mind of the individual looking at it and in the mind of God, it has a spiritual nature. I remember commending a lady in the church here who made the best communion bread I've ever tasted. <laughs> and I, I bragged on her. To, it was her month to make it. And I look forward to the month when she'd make the unleavened bread. Now, right now, she's got a broken ankle. So those at Palm Beach Lakes know who she is. But she has made me an unleavened bread chocolate birthday cake. <laughs> and and so, so I, I, I brag so much about her unleavened bread chocolate, uh, unleavened mm. bread. She on uh, uh, you know uh, on, on my birthday brought me a, probably a six layer of cake. It was about the size of a biscuit that was stacked up six high or something that that lie that that that. <laughs> and, and I don't think that's an unholy use of unleavened bread. I did not make a graven image out of it. But I would like to see a seven <laughs> layers. Seven layers of dice. I remember at uh, Shades Mountain that they they would always uh, uh, take the leftover communion 
stuff and put it in that nursery that was at the back of the auditorium. They would put it right up against the wall uh, behind the auditorium. And on Monday, I, I'd sneak down, you know, because we lived right up the hill from it. I'd sneak down on Monday, come down to the building, sit there and and feast on the uh, on the grape juice and the and the and the uh, leftover crackers. That, that was that was a treat, man. That was free food, man. <laughs> So anyway, Dad, thank you for coming on. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. Had a good conversation this this morning, and uh, uh, hopefully we'll get to see you back here uh, next week as well. But uh, we're going to go ahead and and uh, well, John, John we'll, just because my brother, just because my brother Jerry might ask me, how many did you have watching today? What is that number? Uh, peak connections were sixty eight. Wow! Thank you guys for listening. I I enjoy doing this, and it's so worthwhile and. And uh, I think the the, uh, the sin David committed in numbering the people. Uh, but uh, I am <laughs> glad to understand that when you have a gospel meeting, you have three baptisms or you have 65 baptisms. I don't think you're numbering, n- numbering that type of thing. Uh, it is just so, it fills my heart with thanksgiving that we have all people who are interested in the Bible like people in this group are. Thank you so much. Yeah. yeah, and uh, I it, it it is consistent. They must like you more than they like me, uh, but because uh, consistently, our largest audience of the day of the of the week is Thursday. It is always Thursday. We get the largest audience that we that we get throughout the week. Well, so, well it's on Thursday. We heard about you sneaking and stealing the Lord's Supper you know, before the dinner <laughs> to throw it in the in the rubbish. <laughs> Yes, yes, uh, and that is funny. The kids can't come up and eat it afterwards, but what we're going to do is we're going to take it and throw it away. <laughs> so, That's right. Yeah. Okay, anyway, anyway, good discussion today. Thank you, Dad, for coming on. We're going to take our break here. We're already a little bit past the top of the hour. I'll try to do it as quickly as I can, but uh, give me just a couple, three minutes. We'll get the room here, reset a little bit, and we will come back and pick up our study of First uh, Peter here uh, in just a couple minutes. So sit tight. Be right back with you. All right, everybody. Welcome back here to uh, from the deep end. Um, good to uh, have my dad on with me this morning. Always does a uh, an outstanding job while he's here with us. Do appreciate his uh, uh, insights into the into the Bible. Um, knows more about the Bible than any person I've ever met. So um, I, I'm always appreciative to have the opportunity to uh, uh, spend spend that time 
uh, studying with him. Um, you know, it, it may surprise you. It's been a long time since uh, he and I have actually been in a place where we could kind of have these conversations together. And that's one of the been one of the great benefits to me um, in doing this is to uh, uh, to be able to renew some of those discussions that we uh, we used to have uh, back when. So uh, I, I'm appreciative that uh, your presence allows he and I to have those uh, have those conversations again. But anyway, let's turn our attention back here to the book of First Peter. And as I said, we are in the third chapter. Let me go ahead and bring the Bible up here on the screen. I've got that done properly. There it is. Uh, and see where we stand in terms of our study. We are in the in the in the opening verses of First Peter chapter three. Um, and my chair is too tall, and my head is getting cut off camera. Give me just a second. I got a little over chair here. I'm about to just drop. I'm about to sink right down below. Where is the lever? There. Where, where's the lever to lower my chair? There it is. Hey, hey, I did. I did just drop. Okay. So now I think my head's actually on the screen. So there we go. All right. We're in first Peter chapter three here together. Um, and uh, we were talking here about the uh, the relationship, obviously, of the, the husband and wife, but primarily talking about the relate the uh, uh State status of the wife uh, is where we have been our time yesterday. Mercy down there saying, I'm going to talk about husbands. I promise we'll get down there and talk about the husbands some uh, this morning. With it a little bit late getting started in the hour, we'll see if I get all the way through it or not. But uh, we left off last uh, yesterday talking about this section right here in verse number three about the adornment of the, of the wife. Um, and, you know, I don't believe that this is, as I was trying to say, as our audio kind of cut out on us yesterday, hopefully that won't happen again at the end of the program today. But um, um, I don't believe this this passage should be taken in a uh, an overall kind of universal admonition against, you know, women dressing up. Uh, you know, number one, uh, as I said yesterday, I don't know if you heard me or not, but you know, I really don't want to take that position, like standing in the pulpit and trying to tell that to the good sisters at the church, because that, that's probably not going to go down real well for me. Um, <laughs> but uh, legitimately, I don't think that's the the, the point of this passage. Um, ladies, if you're going out for a nice dinner at night, you know, what, whatever, go 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 ahead and, and put on your high heels and have fun. Uh, I, I don't think that's what Paul Peter rather here is talking about. The, the context really seems to be, um, in, my, in my estimation here, what we're trying to do here in this particular portion of the relationship is we are trying to influence the husband. We are trying to change his direction, change his you know, actions, whatever they may be. And as I talked about at length yesterday, I'll try not to continue to be the dead horse that I beat yesterday. I don't know that this person is necessarily an unbeliever. This is somebody who's simply no big word. Uh, he's always wrong. So he may be an unbeliever. That's been kind of possible. That's the traditional take on the text. But this may just be a, a wandering uh, a, a saint who's gotten caught up because of the trials and all of that that are going on. But the point doesn't really matter in the Let me go ahead and take that logo over my face here a little bit. Um, there we go. Um, what she's trying to do is she is trying to uh, influence uh, her husband and uh, is doing that in order to help him in terms of his relationship to God. He is currently not obeying the word. And obviously that needs to stop. He needs to obey the word again. And that needs to be the direction. We're going to see that here, um, down here when we start dealing with the, hu the husband uh, and the wife again, that we are going to be dealing with th their, their relationship is, um, uh, to always to have in mind that they are heirs together of the grace of life. And so this whole context here, this whole these whole seven verses here, to me seem to have something to do with that portion of the relationship, the way that the, the wife is trying to influence and, and uh, well, influence the actions of the family. Certainly no one has ever thought of Happen. 
All right, now, am I here now? I'm, obviously, I'm here. I'm back. How, how, is, how is the connection now? Um, how is the connection? I'm here. Tell me how the connection is. Let me see if we're any better now. I don't, do not know what is happening here. We have been having all kinds of issues, but, um, well, okay, sounds good now. Okay. I don't know what is going on. I keep getting a, I, I, I do get a, a connection warning. Um, I have no idea. I have no idea. All right, let's see. Let me get that back over here and hold on. Get the stream set back up the way I want. There we go. Okay. Um, as I was saying, I, I, I don't know what, when I started cutting out what y'all heard or not, but let me just try to, go back over that as quickly as I can here. I, I don't think we're talking here about a, a, a blanket uh, prohibition against stylish dress from, from women. As, as I was saying, I believe the point here of this text has to do with the, uh, the, the manner in which a wife attempts to influence her husband. Um, I, I, I highlighted that, highlighted that earlier. I don't know if that's before or after I cut out. Even when we get to the husband, the thing that they're going to, he's going to be told to keep in mind is that you are heirs together of the grace of life. Uh, and we are dealing here, when dealing with the wife, or talking to the wife, we're dealing here with a husband that is not obeying the word. And, and the thought here is um, that by the conduct of the wife, he may be one back to winning the, or, or obeying the word of God again. Okay, So that's the idea. And so I believe what we're doing here is talking to the women, to the wives, about how it is that you go around or you go about influencing your husband. Because, as, as and I'm pretty sure I was cutting out before I got here, I, I am certain that there, there are some wives out there that may have tried to uh, influence their husbands uh, based upon the way that they dress. Sometimes I think y'all might do that to us. I, I think y'all might know that 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 that, that we, we we like uh, uh, we like to look at our wives. We like to look at our women, and um, and and if you dress in a particular way, uh, that might get us to uh, to respond in a particular way. Okay, uh, it works. That's why y'all do it. It's because it works. <coughs> and so I think that's the idea here. Uh, don't let your adorning be on the external. In other words, in other words, that's your focus. That's your em emphasis. That's the way you're trying to, you're going to try and, 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 and well, to influence, hold sway over your husband. Okay. Uh, it doesn't mean you can't, you know, put on the high heels and the earrings when you go out to, 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 to dinner with your husband. Okay. Go, go ahead and get all dressed up and, 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 and <coughs> you know, excuse me, look all, look all cute and all that kind of stuff. That, that's going to be perfectly fine. We're not talking, I don't, <coughs> excuse me, I don't think that's the um, particular context of this passage. Um, but when it comes to trying to have influence and sway over your uh, over your husband, make sure you're doing it the proper way. You want to influence your husband not based upon some kind of physical attraction. Uh, you want to influence your husband based upon a moral or spiritual matter that, in the end, is going to be lasting. 
Um, because if all you have in terms of your relationship and, you, and the, the, the sway that you have with your husband is how you adorn yourself, you're going to, uh, obviously at some point, that's going to fade. Uh, and in contrast to that, there is an imperishable beauty that you can have and you can display with, um, um, that you will display towards your husband uh, and, and have that portion of the relationship with him. And so I believe that, that, that I believe that's the emphasis that we're dealing with here. We are adorning the hidden person of the heart. So continue to, to develop that portion uh, of your person. And we're going to do that with what he refers to as this imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, right? Um, that thought, again, is, is for our world very much countercultural. You're not allowed to say that kind of thing um, uh, these days about a woman. But uh, particularly here, uh, it is it is poignant and it is it is it is true. Um, there are very I, you know every every couple every relationship is different, um, and all of that. Uh, I get it. Uh, every time I talk about this with uh, with uh, you know like doing some premarital counseling or something along those lines, um, I'm always reminded of of, uh, of the first church I worked at. One of the elders there and his wife uh, were, again, some of the best people I've ever met. Good friends of ours, Julian ours. Uh, he, he has since passed. Uh, you know, took took a passed fairly early in life. Had a bad bad uh, downturn with some dementia or Alzheimer's, whichever one it was, um, and and didn't have a good ending. But when we knew them, um, you know, of course, we Julian and I were in our twenties. They were probably in their late forties, early fifties at the time. Um. And they were the funniest couple to be around that you'll ever see. They would bicker and fuss at each other about everything. I mean, they were just hilarious to be around because they were just always just at each other. And, and it was just fun to sit back and watch them. They were, they were like that. And they, they were high strung about everything. And it worked. They loved each other more than anybody could, you know, you, you just no doubt about them whatsoever. If Julie and I did that with each other, uh, man, we would have been divorced 30 years ago. Uh, that, that you, we can't do that with each other. That's not how we relate. Uh, when we get fussing with each other, it gets really quiet, really quiet and cold in the house for a few days. Uh, that, that That's how we do it. Okay. So every, every relationship, every, every couple, uh, is, um, is, 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 is like that. You, so there's, there's obviously variations in here, but I want to tell you as a general rule, ladies, um, if you don't know it by now, you need to know it. Your husband probably not going to respond to you the best way to, 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 if, if you're that stereotypical nagging, berating, ridiculing type wife, um, you know, in, 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 in typical fashion, uh, women are often better at the verbal argumentation than men. They 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 usually end up talking a whole lot more than we do. Um, you know, it may surprise you when the camera goes off. I don't talk nearly as much as you might think I do. Nope, I, I am perfectly fine sitting in a room by myself, not saying a word. Uh, perfectly happy with that. And. Um, you know, if you want to tell me something, and you, and you want to, please don't, please don't take half an hour to tell me your story. But please, please let's 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 get this thing done faster. Uh, you know, my, my typical phone conversation is about thirty five seconds. After about that, I'm ready to hang up and get off. Uh, it's just why are we still on the phone? Um, and I don't know that I'm a, I don't know that I'm unusual in that regard. Again, every man's different. But if you're trying to influence your husband, first of all, we're going to get down here to the husbands. We are. I promise you, we are getting down to the husbands. Um, but um, the husband is told to uh, live with his wife in an understanding way. Yeah, that, that, that probably needs to go back the other direction as well. Um, a quiet and gentle spirit in trying to influence your husband is probably going to be the better path.
And again, I know that's countercultural. I know that's not the popular kind of thing to say today, uh, but it's true. Okay. Um, which in God's sight is very precious. So let's not just talk here about the husband and how you might influence the husband. Let's talk about the wife or let's talk about God rather, excuse me. Let's talk about God. That spirit is in God's sight very precious. That's probably just natively and intrinsically true. Uh, meekness is a trait that God loves. Uh, the meek shall inherit the earth. Uh, in the Beatitudes, meekness is obviously a trait that is is loved by God. Um, but keep under uh, keep in mind what is being being said here in this particular context. We are dealing with a woman who is being in submission, in subjection to her husband. Uh, and we just came out, and sometimes these chapter divisions hurt us when we try to study our Bibles together. We just came out of a section of Scripture talking about the um, example that Christ left of suffering injustice, of when he was reviled, reviling not again, and so on. Uh, and even just before that, we're dealing here with the idea that a, a, a servant should be subject to his master uh, and and that a citizen should be subjected to the government that he's under, okay? That, that's this this style all through here. <clears throat> um, we are now dealing with a wife who is subject to a husband that is not obeying the word. Not necessarily the best situation. It's easy to read this text and to read some of the admonition here of this text as if we're just dealing here with a, with a, a standard uh, um, um, uh, relationship, standard conditions in the relationship. In a, in a period of time in the relationship where the husband is not obeying the word, the wife still maintains herself with a quiet and gentle disposition. That is very precious to God. I love that word very being in there. That is <clears throat> very precious to God. Um, in the end, it's going to be true for the husband and the wife here as we, as we start to make that transition. Um, in the end, you are not serving your spouse when you do when you do right by them. You're serving God. And whether or not your spouse reciprocates and treats you fairly and 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 responds the way they ought to to godliness and holiness and, and all the things being talked about here, um, someone else notices that. So even if your spouse doesn't notice it, somebody else does. And of course, that's God. And so don't, don't ever lose sight of that, ladies. You may be having to be subject to a man who is not obeying the word and is not the man you want him to be. Okay? It's not your job to fix him. It's not your job to go out and, and with a multiplicity of words, try to fix your husband. It won't work. Okay, not, not as a general rule. That won't work. Your job is to focus on the imperishable beauty that cannot be taken away, that will never fa that will never falter and never fail. And to develop that disposition of meekness, gentleness, quietness in the face of somebody who is doing wrong. Knowing that in God's sight, in God's sight, he sees it. He sees what you're doing. He, he sees the sacrifice that you're making, and it is very precious to him. Okay? That's the point. So, and then verse 5, for this is how the holy women who hoped in God used to adorn themselves by submitting to their own husbands, as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. Okay? There, there it is. This is how the holy women, again, who hoped in God, notice the connection there. These are individuals who, who had their focus, their hearts tuned into God. Uh, they adorned themselves in the way that, that Peter says here, you need to adorn yourself. And by continuing to submit to your husbands, as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. We made the point yesterday, I believe it was, as we started looking at this section of scripture. Um, Abraham um, was not always a perfect man. 
Um, you know, he, he, he simply wasn't. Uh, you, you, and, and there are times when Sarah had to submit to him and probably didn't agree with the things that he was doing. Um, you know, was she in full agreement when she was told to essentially, well, at best, tell a half-truth? Um, as I've heard people say, a half-truth is a whole lie. Okay. But obviously not giving a fair representation of, of her and Abraham's relationship once in the land of Egypt and the second time in the house of Abimelech. Um, was she fully on board with that? Did she think, did she think, Hey man, that's, that, that's, that's the plan we have here. That's going to work. Don't know. But she obeyed her husband and she followed him. Uh, even back it up where maybe she, he's not in the case of that doing something wrong. Um, when he says to, 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 to Sarah, hey, uh, pack up your bags. We're moving to someplace that I don't know where we're going. Um, and she said, yeah, let's do that. What we think we the ancient area of Ur was a fairly well advanced and developed city. I mean, she, she was living in, in, on, you know, on, on, um, um, uh, you know, like she was living in, 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 in the New York of her world or the Paris of her world. Um, and, um, she, um, she packed it all up and said, no, I think I'll leave. I think I'll leave and go with you. Okay. Uh, not always the easiest thing. Certainly not when, when you're not the one in charge. Um, but she, the point here is that Peter's making she obeyed and she followed him, even to the point of uh, calling him Lord. And then he says, and you are her children. If you do good and do not fear anything that is frightening. Okay. And you are her children. Now I've, I've held to the point uh, throughout this study. And I think it's still, still to be, to, to be the case and to be true that the um, audience of this book is largely Jewish. And so probably here, we are talking to um, you know people that would be swayed and motivated by a, a callback to Sarah would probably be, probably be Jewish ladies, um, and understand that you know they they came from Abraham and Sarah through Isaac, so that connection is there, and I think that's probably the people that we're talking about here or talking to here rather, um, and they obviously would love to be able to say yes we are we are her children we we are just like our mother. Uh, because of, of the connection and the affinity that all Jewish individuals were going to have toward Abraham and Sarah. So he says to them, Peter does, you are her children, but don't just be her children physically. I mean, it's not just your genetics that make you her children. What make you her children is if you follow her example and follow the, the commitment of her life. And that commitment was in every time and in, in all things, I am going to do good and I'm not going to allow fear to overwhelm me. I'm not going to become frightened about the, the circumstances around me. Um, can't take this phrase out of the broader context of the book because um, this is the book of tribulation. All right. And, and I, I know I've talked about it probably every day, but you've got the fiery trial in chapter four. You've got the grievous trials in chapter one. You've got the little while suffering of chapter five the glory that is to follow. And after you've suffered a while, God will establish a strengthen and settle you. What's that down about verse 10 or 11 or so of, of, of chapter five? All of that is through throughout this book. All right. And here specifically, here's a Christian wife who is entering to this period of trial uh, and the fiery trial has come upon them. The, the uh, a time has come that judgment must begin with Christians. Christians are going to go through this suffering first. Uh, the time has come that judgment must begin.
All right, I'm back. Y'all got me? Y'all hear me? I have, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I'm having some thoughts here. Um. This has started happening ever since I got the system back from getting repaired. Guess I need to check. Wonder if. Hold on, give me give me a second here. Um, I'm gonna have to do 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 do. Um. I need to do something here. Y'all get to sit with me here for just a minute. Um, sit with me here for just a second, if you will. Um, I'm wondering if there is not some kind of um um wonder if it's a t I'm thinking it might be some kind of uh heat issue. That's kind of what I'm wondering because it happens after we have been streaming for a while and I just got got the system back, got a new motherboard put in it, and I'm wondering if you could have a cooling issue on the new motherboard. So give me um um, give me just a, now I'm completely frozen. I am completely frozen. Completely frozen.
All right, how about now? You got me now? Probably should. I had to restart the audio engine. So the whole system just locked up on me a second ago. Hope the sound should be back now. Uh, let, let me know. Yeah, the whole thing just um, shut down on me. Froze up. What I was what I was saying before we before I went away is I, I as I had the um, had the um, uh, the 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 system repaired. I've been we've been having these issues about an hour and a half or so into the stream uh, ever since I got the system back. Um, so I don't know if that's got anything to do with it. I I, I was kind of thinking it might be a cooling issue. Maybe the system is getting hot, um, and so I just actually just installed a, a CPU temperature monitor, and it's not actually doing that badly. I mean, it's sitting right at about fifty nine degrees uh, Celsius, which is not hot. The hottest core is only sixty two. This could be the GPU. One of the graphics cards getting hot. I don't know, people. I'm not. I'm not sure. Um, I think it's you don't know, packet overload, Nelson. If it were just a connection issue, that would be. Calls the system to freeze. Huh. Okay. I can't argue with you because I'm sitting here looking at the, the 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 temperature, the heat on it, and it's it's not um. No, it's not spiking. It, it, it's 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 stable. Right at um, actually right now. The real-time temperature, all the cores are sitting, right now the hottest core is at 50, 53 degrees centigrade. So it's, it's clearly not an overheating issue. Hmm. Well, I'm not sure what to do now. Anyway, um, that kind of mis interrupts our study there a little bit, a little bit doesn't it? Um, um, I'm not sure how to, how to, how to troubleshoot this any farther than, 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 than this point. Um, nothing else has changed in the setup, doing exactly the same thing. Same camera, same software setup. I don't know. This is three days in a row now, though, and that is not cool. That is not cool at all. I'll have to try and figure that out. Um, well, Nelson, if you've got some ideas, shoot me a message. Let me know. Uh, if you've got, any, you got any suggestions about how to fix it, I will certainly uh, take your, uh, your input on it because I am a bit stumped at the moment about what could be going on here. So um, let me know if uh, Nelson or anybody else out there that might have some uh, insight on the matter, because this is something we need to get fixed. Um, um, uh, I mean, um, hey, I don't really have anything running in the background other than the, the stuff I need. I've got... Um, Obviously, got the browser up, and browsers are resource hogs. Uh, it's amazing how much browsers take, but I basically have the tabs up that I need to run the stream. Uh, I got my Bible program, obviously, but that's not that big of a resource hog. Once it loads up the, you know, sometimes sometimes it'll index the stuff in the background, but even then, it's it's not hitting the CPU at all. It's hitting the hard drive some. Um, but it's it's not that big of a resource hog. The browsers uses much more. Um, um, wire shark. Okay, I've never heard of it, Nelson. Um, 
there's just, just not that much going on in the background, and, and I'll, I'll tell you, this is not exactly a, uh, a, um, it, it, it's it's pretty stout. It, it's a pretty stout desktop computer. It, it, it's, uh, um, you know, two two years ago it was a pretty good, pretty good, pretty good uh, um, uh, uh, purchase. But um, um, so I don't think it's um, an easy or um, um, okay. Does it give me? Uh, Here we go. Anywho, um, captures network traffic. Does it give me a, um, did that just freeze again? Camera did. Camera just froze. Can y'all still hear me? Yep. Can you hear me? Because I know I froze. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm still going out on the audio side or not, but yeah, I'm definitely frozen here. Um, that is the weirdest thing. Um, this is the weirdest thing. Phone's ringing. System's not frozen, just the um, the other thing, the camera is frozen. Okay, um, if I stop that. Is it a capture card issue? In fact, the rest of that I wouldn't think. Close that. That is now closed. Hey, take the cameras back. All right, I guess I'm going to go ahead and um, shut her down. Um, and hopefully we uh, that'll give me uh, several days here to try and figure out what's going on. Uh, maybe run some tests on it or something. But uh, sorry about that, everybody. Um, to interrupt the study once again but um uh, i guess we'll I'll, I'll go ahead and sign off we'll see you back here i think greg uh, dismuke is going to be with us tonight in the um, slot for connect so um hopefully we won't have issues with him tonight uh we did last week but um that will um again hopefully be uh, worked out there on his end as well so um but i'll see you back here for from the deep end here on Monday, and hopefully by then I will have some better idea of what is going on here, 
and uh, not have this interruption again. That's three days in a row. Uh, and that doesn't make me very happy. So uh, go out and have a good day, everybody. We'll see you back here tonight for the Connect meeting.